Rabbi David Rosen, former Chief Rabbi of Ireland, is the International Director of Interreligious Affairs of the American Jewish Committee. Rabbi Rosen is Honorary Advisor on Interfaith Relations to the Chief, Chief Rabbi Rabbinate of Israel, serves on its Commission for Interreligious Dialogue, and represents the Chief Rabbinate on the Council of Religious Institutions of the Holy Land. Rabbi Rosen was a member of the Permanent Bilateral Commission of the State of Israel and the Holy See that negotiated the establishment of full diplomatic normalization of relations between the two. He is the only Jew on the board of directors of the Saudi Arabian Interfaith Center, along with Austria, Spain, and the Holy See. He is the only Orthodox rabbi knighted by the Vatican and decorated by Queen Elizabeth II. Please help me welcome Rabbi Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am very grateful for this honor to be able to participate in this important gathering. Uh, as you may have gathered, however, I'm not precisely the right person for this session or maybe I am, but in another capacity, because I am employed to play the role of ambassador for Judaism to the religions of the world, and therefore my mandate is actually international rather than specifically local, which I've been asked to address. But at least 50% of the time I am at home, so I suppose I can talk also about local matters as well. Um, and indeed, international matters, of course, pertain here, and especially my involvement, uh, which within the Jewish community is rather unique with the Catholic Church that has created a very special era in terms of Catholic-Jewish relations. Um, in fact, it is precisely as a result of this dramatic transformation in Catholic-Jewish relations that interfaith relations generally here in the Holy Land have had a significant transformation. It's important to bear in mind that most Israelis have never met a modern Christian. Most Israelis have never met a modern Christian. Even though we love to travel abroad, and perhaps we have the wanderlust in our blood, certainly we have suffer from a certain claustrophobia, being surrounded by a degree of hostility, so we like to get out. But when we travel abroad, we meet non-Jews overwhelmingly as non-Jews, not as professing people from any other particular faith. And therefore, the image of Christianity overwhelmingly within Israeli society is taken from the negative, tragic past. In fact, most Israelis, if they were to be honest with you, would tell you that a Christian is somebody who, if they don't want to do physical harm to them, certainly wants to steal their soul. One of the most dramatic, and of course, the, if there are encounters between Christians, these would tend to be within the context of a conflict, and therefore it's exacerbated by politics. One of the great transformations, and it was a great honor for me to be part of the team that established the diplomatic relations with the Vatican, was that it paved the way for the visit of St. John Paul II in the year 2000. This was the dramatic pope who is the symbol of the transformation in Catholic-Jewish relations. He is the true revolutionary for whom the greatest credit grows, goes in terms of his impact, not only in terms of documents and in terms of the uh, language which has now become ensconced within the Catholic Church of the elder brother, de dearly beloved elder brother of the covenant, but because of his penchant for dramatic, symbolic, visual gestures, his visit here here in the year 2000 was of enormous significance. And it was led to, I would say, a sea change in Jewish perceptions of the Christian world. To see, most people don't read the documents. Certainly most Jews don't know the Catholic documents. I'm not sure how many Catholics know the Catholic documents. But nevertheless, people watch television, they see images. And to see a pope at Yad Vashem in tearful solidarity with Jewish suffering, 
to discover the stories of how he saved Jewish children during the period of the Shoah, how afterwards instructed children of, who had been baptized by adoptive Catholic parents to return them back to their original Jewish parents, to see him at the Kotel at the Western Wall, putting there the text of a prayer for forgiveness for all the terrible things done against the Jews over 2,000 years, that blew Israeli Jews' minds. That was the most dramatic testimony that a new reality had taken place. And on that visit, Pope John Paul II, at his initiative, met with the chief rabbinate council of Israel and the chief rabbis. And he said to them, there are organizations that represent the Jewish world to the Catholic Church, but I would like us to have our own bilateral commission between the chief rabbinate and the Holy See. Now, I'm an Orthodox rabbi, but I would describe myself as a modern Orthodox rabbi. I would say most of my colleagues within the religious establishment in Israel are pre-modern Orthodox. The chief rabbinate of Israel does not have a committee for dialogue with other kinds of Jews. It never thought of having a council for dialogue with another religion. But when a pope asks you to, it's rather difficult to say no. So I am the beneficiary of other people's absence and ignorance. They needed an Orthodox rabbi who at least knows what the difference is between a Catholic and a Protestant, if not between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. As a result, I have the honor to be involved in the engagement of the chief rabbinate with all its interfaith activities. Now, as a result of Pope John the, Paul II's initiative, People who had never met Christians before and who had narrow-minded perceptions began to change them. And these, we're talking about multiplicators who have ramifications beyond their own particular position. In addition, this led to the establishment of a council which Archbishop Pizzaballa is an integral, critical part of, which is called the Council of the Religious Institutions of the Holy Land. This is the first time ever that there is a council for cooperation, collaboration, and communication between the Christian leadership of the Holy Land, the Palestinian Muslim leadership of its Ministry of Waqf and Sharia courts, and the Chief Rabbinate of Israel. This council, it has a website, you can go and see what its work is, crihl.org, Council of Religious Institutions of the Holy Land, has three purposes. One is to keep open avenues of communication between the different religious leaders, and there it's been moderately successful, sometimes more than other. The second goal is to combat incitement and defamation. So any attack on a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a cemetery or, any, or on adherence is condemned by all three religions together, and that has been effective. The media hasn't been terribly interested because that's good news, and the media basically makes its living out of bad news. That's not the media's fault. That's something in the human breast that prefers blood and guts to good news. At any rate... That, I would say, is a moderate success. The third goal of the council is to declared by all the religious representatives is to provide religious support for political initiatives to bring an end to the conflict so that two peoples and three religions may flourish in the land. That is the declared purpose, and in that regard, it's a glorious failure because the politicians are not interested in engaging the religious leadership in terms of addressing the challenges we face. And that's not only the local politicians for whom I can, can understand it to a degree, because within Israeli society, religion has become a political commodity that is used for, for coalition building and for electioneering and for political dividends, but also, of course, fears with on the Palestinian side that radical Islamists may capture the voice. But even those who have initiated peace initiatives have avoided engaging with religious leaders, have not met with a council or individual religious leaders. George Mitchell, who came here on behalf of the United States, or John Kerry, are more recently, came so many times they didn't meet with a single religious leader, let alone with a council. Not with Christian, not with Muslim, not with Jewish. Generally speaking, they have avoided. Why? Because there is an understandable perception on the part of those diplomats and politicians that religion is part of the problem, therefore it is best avoided. But that is a fallacy. If you do not want religion to be part of the problem, you have to make it part of the solution. If you avoid it, you simply leave the podium of open for exploitation by extremist elements. If you don't want extremist elements to capture the central voice, you need to make sure that you enlist effectively, constructively, 
those mainstream moderate voices. And this has not been done until very recently when, for the first time, and whatever you think of the present US administration, it's not relevant to the point I'm making, for the first time, a representative of the president, this was his emissary, Jason Greenblatt, met with the council, with the Christian heads, the Muslim representatives, the chief rabbis, and a few other rabbis, hosted by the consul general. To sh out of recognition, he said, that there is a religious dimension that is critical. So this is the essential point. There are those that think that religion can bring about an end to the conflict here, and that religion can bring about a political solution. Those that really think that are at best naive. Anybody who has a religious peace plan who thinks religion can bring an end to the conflict, in my opinion, is living in cloud cuckoo land, not in total reality. But, as one of the bishops said at the meeting with Greenblatt, we cannot make peace, but peace will not succeed without us. And that is really important. Religion, not everybody here is religious. In fact, some people here are even anti-religious. But everybody's identity here is rooted in some religious heritage. It has to do with the intangibles. To avoid it is ultimately to court its problematic dimension. To engage it offers the opportunity for certain something constructive. So there are, I have one minute, five. Oh, thank you, that's very generous. Okay. So I would say with regard, however, I, was asked to I wasn't asked to address this, though I, <laughs> though I think it's interesting. I was asked to address local interreligious and intercultural dialogue initiatives. Now, here we have, need to make it clear that in Israel, and to some extent in the region, but especially in Israel, we have two critical hurdles that make interreligious and intercultural dialogue very difficult. The problem is not just political, it is also social and educational. People here do not have contact with one another. Even within their own specific communities, they are separated. If you travel up in the Galilee, you will see Jewish towns, Arab towns. You will see a Muslim Arab village. You will see a Christian Arab village. You will see a Druze Arab village. Within Jewish towns, there will be an ultra-Orthodox, so-called Hasidic neighborhood, a modern Orthodox neighborhood, a secular neighborhood, all for very good reasons. Nobody is forcing them to be segregated. People want to live with those who are like them, where they feel comfortable. Our educational system compounds that because our educational system is a local educational system. Therefore, if you live in South Jerusalem and you want your children to go to North Jerusalem school, you have to sell your house in South Jerusalem and move to North Jerusalem in order for your children to go to that school, which means the schools cater for the local neighborhoods. If the local neighborhoods are segregated, the schools, by definition, tend to be segregated in terms of what they are. Therefore, even within our society, people do not meet people different from them as a matter of course. The army plays an important role in this regard. Universities can play, but even then there are still elements who don't go to army, who don't go to universities, and therefore most people are not in... The Americans love to invent new words. I go to America often, so I discovered they have turned the word dialogue into a verb. So I could say our society is not dialogical. It's not a natural environment for dialogue. Therefore, there is an amazing paradox this society is not naturally conducive for dialogue. But probably we have more organizations here working in intercultural dialogue and even in interreligious dialogue than anywhere else, numerically. How do we square this circle? Because there is a significant tiny percentile, if that, of the population that is deeply committed to this engagement. But to be deeply committed, you have to go out of your safety zone, you have to go out of your geographic context, and you have to make an effort. And therefore, that is not the norm. That is why leadership organizations that are only just emerging now are so significant. But we have an abundance of interreligious and intercultural organizations. Of course, here is the second problem. The second problem is that Israeli society is in a bit of a Kulturkampf. It's not precise to make it totally binary, because there are many different segments in it. But there is enormous tension between what we may call forces of religious devotion and forces of secularization, 
or of secular orientation. And within this context, you see a, a paradox even in the work we are talking about. Secular, inter secular intercultural activities are generally speaking devoid of real religious representation. Religious, inter-religious engagement of any serious religious commitment are generally not comfortable for people of a more secular orientation. Therefore, there tends to be a disparity and even a gulf and sometimes even a certain alienation from one group in relation to another. So I would like to give you many, many examples of each different category, but the chair lady has indicated that my time has run out, so you'll have to take it on my authority that there is a plethora of activity, and if you're interested to discover what that plethora of activity is, there are many that could give you plenty of responses, and I would be happy to be among them. Thank you.